Okay, everybody uh, have a seat. We're going to try to, we got three more papers to present, two here, one and one on virtual. And, um, and we'll go into our reception and we'll closing unit after that. So everybody have a seat. And uh, who's going to chair? No, Daniel. Okay, um, I'll turn it over. Thank you. Uh, so the last session of the workshop is what is needed for future cement blends and cement placement technologies. Daniel and I will be chairing this session. Um, we will have a first presentation uh, by Yun Shun Lu, who is a PhD student at Pittsburgh University. And he will offer some alternative solution to uh, partial cement as is. Please. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Yun Xin. You can call me Aaron. Aaron is my Starbucks name. I love it. <laughs> yeah. And today, the topic that I'm going to talk about today is uh, olivine based cement for geothermal conditions. So, we also call this olivine based cement as OBC for your information. So, um, like as we discussed through the geothermal rising and the workshop, we already know the uh, porous cement is not ideal ideal con candidates for these geothermal conditions for many reasons. For example, high temperature, high pressure, uh, temperature variations, and the corrosive nature of the reservoir. But as uh, Daniel said, uh, even though it's not great, but we still need them in the short term. So right now, the question really becomes, how can we improve the performance of the poor cement under the geothermal conditions? So if we uh, look back to our mother nature. So we were surprisingly found that the, the calcium and the magnesium and carbonates are everywhere in the nature. So those three pictures is a uh, kind of matter published in 2008 at the proceeding of National Academy of Science. It's a very low paper. So uh, those white wing in these uh, pictures are the calcium and the magnesium carbonates. So actually they are the main rock forming minerals in the nature and they have a superior chemical and physical properties due to the compact and the well-developed accreting microstructures of the calcium and the magnesium carbonates. So this uh, like does inspire us, can we use this uh, geological reaction for designing our geothermal cementing materials? So for this uh, geological reactions here, mainly refers to the carbonation reaction of the ultramafic rock. So uh, let me introduce, uh, like talk about a little bit about this, uh, what is the ultramafic rock is. So basically it's uh, an igneous rock with low silica, but enriched in magnesium and iron. So this carbonation reaction of the ultramafic rock actually has two steps. The first is dissolution. And the second step is the precipitations. So if we want to use this uh, carbonation reaction of the ultramafic rock for designing our geothermal cementing materials, the main problem we're facing is this reaction takes geological time to form as the surface conditions. So the surface conditions here means ambient temperature and ambient pressure. So as an engineer researcher, the problem like for me is how to reduce the geological time to the engineering time. So luckily, uh, Kalman Matter also published another paper. So they studied this uh, carbonation reaction, relationship between carbonation reaction rate with the uh, temperature and the pressure. In this figure, you can see the y-axis is a carbonation reaction rate and the x-axis is the temperature and different legend in the uh, figure is a different the pressure. So we can see as the pressure goes up, the re carbonation reaction rate goes up. And the optimal temperature zoom is falling between 150 to 250, which is happened to fall into the typical temperature range of the geothermal conditions that we discussed uh, those days. So uh, their conclusion is at optimum of 200 degrees C and uh, 300 bar, which is for around 4,000 PSI. So the carbonation reaction can be increased by 10 to six or 10 to seven times that's uh, huge accelerations. So based on their work, so it's give us a really bold idea 
uh, which is very ambitious. But as we discussed yesterday, uh, we need to think out of a box. We need to, although we need a balance man right now, but we need also looking for the alternative solutions. So like we're thinking, can we create a cement-free and a magnesium carbonate-based cementitious material? So because the situation we're facing is we have a high temperature, high pressure, and corrosive fluid and low pH in our reservoir. So those three conditions are the necessary conditions for accelerate the carbonation reactant of the alpha tronic alpha, rock. So if we want to create a cement-free material and a resilient isolation system, so what bridge can bring us from the left side to the right side of the figure? So that's the solution we're proposed here. Can we use a carbonation reaction of the ultramafic rock at HP, HT, and the AG standing for the acidic geofluids to create this geological activated cement material we call the GAC. It's cement-free and based on the magnesium and carbonate as a binder. So by having this idea, we start our uh, preliminary experiment study. So I will show you the experiment setup for genesis of the GAC. The GAC is a geologically activated cement. So we build our, our reactor by stainless steel. So this stainless steel can go, uh, can withstand the temperature, uh, pressure up to 4,000 PSI. And the upstream of this thing, uh, reactor is connected to a syringe pump, which can provide the pressure to up to 10,000 PSI. The downstream of this uh, reactor has a cap, which behaves as a closed system. So the reactor, the whole reactor is placed in an uh, oven, which can provide temperature up to 250 degrees C. So uh, the materials we're using, we're using the aluminum sand, which is one of the uh, ultramafic rock. So we'll crash the aluminum sand into uh, like the particle uh, diameter of the uh, uh, aluminum sand is less than 75 microns. So we'll mix them with the uh, uh, sodium bicarbonates. So the sodium bicarbonate here is acting as a CO2 source because uh, as the as sodium bicarbonates, when the temperature goes above 50 degrees C, so the sodium bicarbonates will have this uh, decomposition, decomposition reaction, will start to produce CO2. So once the CO2 is produced, the, the gas CO2 will first dissolve in the water to form the uh, to form the uh, carbonic acid. So this carbonic acid will react with the magnesium silicate to release the, uh, to have the dissolution reaction to release the magnesium ion. So this magnesium ion will, uh, will react with the carbonate to have this equation four. So if we add up those equation from equation one to equation four, we will have our final equation uh, five, which is uh, the carbonation reaction of the, so of the olivine. So this magnesium carbonate will act as a binder. I know you guys hate those equations, but just through this complicated equation, I just want to show how simple the reaction is. So uh, we put the uh, reaction. So this is a, a pioneering study, preliminary study of our uh, experiment study. So the left figure uh, A is showing the loosened aluminum sand before the reaction. So you can see within 24 hours, those uh, loosened sand become hard and solid carbonate masses lodged firmly in the reactor. So we put those uh, um, like products under SEM and the EDX and do the XRD. We found out we do generate a lot of magnesium, magnesium carbonates. So those magnesium carbonates are like acting as binder or glue everything to form this uh, hardened mass in the reactor. So uh, the successful of this preliminary study really give us confidence to uh, move forward, move one step forward. I mean, can we? Like, because uh, this is uh, still a long-term study because this we call cement free. So, but uh, in short term, we still need the uh, Portland cement. So what, what we're wondering if we add those into Portland cement, what will happen? Can this improve the performance of the Portland cement? So that's uh, the uh, another topic that I will talk. So I will talk next. Uh, so the solution we propose here, we're trying to use all the micro particles as a micro aggregates to pour in cement, we call olivine based cement, we call OBC. So by doing this, we're trying to leverage the high temperature, high pressure and the geo acidic geofluid conditions uh, for the geothermal conditions. And we're trying to enable 
the acceleration of the carbonation and hydration that associated with the olivin particles. That will give a robust uh, self-restoration ability to the OBC. And finally, we want to uh, give more resilience to the current cement system. Uh, so, uh, so by uh, interrupting, by disrupting the chains of failure events, which can start with the leaching or the uh, acidic attack and end up with the compromised mechanical properties and uh, reduce the isolation functions. Uh, so from this slide, I will start to introduce the materials and the, and the methodologies that, that we're using. So for the materials that we're using, we're crashing the olivine particles into 10 to uh, 13 microns. By following the APN standard, we're mixing the, slurries, uh, the, uh, the cement slurry with those olivine particles and the made the density as uh, 16.4 uh, 16 ppg. And because before this study, we are not quite sure what is the optimum olivine percentage. So we choose three different percentage, with the, which is the five percentage, 15 and 30. So the cement is a hydration and curing at 90 degrees C and 95 relative humidity for 28 days. So for the methodology, we'll, we'll first start with the SEM, XRD, uh, micro indentations. And uh, we also did the UCS structure at high temperature, high pressure, and the long-term uh, we call creep test. And finally, we send those samples after the structural test, we send those samples to NETL uh, to scan the internal fracture partners uh, for these uh, observations. So, but um, before I start to introduce the results, so I do uh, very agree with the idea that yesterday Susan and Daniel proposed yesterday. So we need, we do need to share the information of each other. So I will first start to share the, our, the information of our lab capacity here at PET. So, oh, by the way, so uh, this is my uh, PhD advisor, Andy Bonger. So, uh, so he's a hydraulic fraction guy. If you are doing the unconventional, probably you will know him more. Um, so himself is driving a uh, Honda, but uh, we also said uh, she, uh, he, he got a Lamborghini in, in the lab, so which is the big yellow frame. It's a polyaxial cell. So it's, uh, it, which makes sense because the money is kind of the same. So, so in our lab, we have a two uh, polyaxial cell. Uh, one is bigger, uh, the capacity 200 ton. Another is uh, a, a little bit smaller, the 100 ton. And the, the sample dimension can go up, go up to uh, two, uh, 20 inches for cubic. If you have a cylindrical sample, we do have two hook, hook cells. Uh, one is smaller, is 30 millimeter for diameter. Another is bigger for 100 millimeter. And uh, for the material testing frames, we do have Instrong and have the uh, have MTS. So basically, we can do the fatigue creep and the tension test. And we do have the 16 channel AE detection system and the eight channel ultrasound uh, tomography system. But the good things for our lab is all our uh, testing can, like the temperature can go up to 180 C. So, which is uh, very good. So uh, from this slides, I will start to introduce, uh, like talk about the results. So this is uh, from the microscopy, from the SEM, we can see uh, before, because by before adding these olein particles into cement, we have concerns that we don't want to the olein particles influence have any negative influence on the cement matrix. So, but from the results, we luckily uh, we it, it, it does not because uh, for 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 example, from the right bottom figure, so the red color thing is olein particle, and the gray, uh, pink, blue thing is the cement matrix. So the boundary between them are very clear. So we, from this result, we can clearly say we do not, the olivine particles do not have any negative impact on the cement hydration. So for this OBC cement, we also did the uh, porosity and permeability measurement, which you can, for the porosity, for the OB, five percentage of olivine cement do have a little bit uh, decrease of the porosity, but permeability, I, I think they are the same. But for the UCS, we do see a uh, increase of the UCS by adding the uh, olivine particles. You can see, so the UCS of the new cement is uh, like from around like 46 to 49, but the UCS of the olivine cement is from 57 to six, from uh, 61 and so MPA, which is like 10 to 20 uh, percentage increase. 
So, uh, but uh, for the UCS, it's testing at room temperature. And uh, as we discussed yesterday, I think it's really important to test, to test those samples at uh, uh, in-situ conditions. That's the reason why we, did, we also did a triaxial test. So uh, the testing condition is we uh, test those samples at 6,000 PSI and 90 degrees C. So the left curve is the string stress curve from the triaxial test. So the y-axis is uh, actual stress and unit of MPA. The x-axis is the string. So the blue curve, the yellow curve is the control, uh, is the control sample of the Nisman. We add like zero olein particle into it. So the orange particle, uh, the orange color is a five percentage or the, the orange color is five per percentage olivin and the gray color is 15 percentage olivin and the, the blue color is 30 percentage of olivin. So we can see this five percent percentage of olivin give us the highest peak, which occur at a string of zero, zero point zero zero two. But one interesting phenomenon, uh, like phenomenon we observed is once the olivin percentage go up to 30, so the Young's modulus become really low, which can evidence, which is if we zoom in the earlier linear part of this curve, we can see the slope of this blue line is like slow, is smaller than the rest of them. So which is very interesting. So this is also evidenced by the red figure that this is a CT scan results we get from NETL. So NETL help us do this high resolution CT scan. So you can see the bottom uh, figure is a, a CT of 30% OBC. So we can clearly see the fracture in 30% is less than the 15 and 5%. So, oh, probably some of you, if you are doing geomechanics, probably you, uh, you, see, you, you, you are seeing that, that there are two, uh, like one horizontal fractures uh, in the group one and group three. So that's a not uh, typical fractures uh, like from the triaxial test. So what we observe here is very interesting because we, so, uh, we did a, a parametric study, a systematic study of this, how, the, how this uh, horizontal, uh, what we call disking fracture happens. So if you are doing the triaxial, the first things you want to uh, increase your, uh, increase your uh, pressure static to the hydrostatic. For example, we're using 6,000 PSI as confining. So, but then uh, if you are doing the triaxial, you will, add, you will increase actual load until the sample is failure. But if you stop at 6,000 PSI as a hydrostatic and release this hydrostatic really quick, for example, in two seconds, and yes, that's how those disc gain are happens. So uh, like this, another paper that me and uh, my uh, PhD advisor are working on. So we are believed, so those uh, disking are caused by the poor mechanics because those samples are fully saturated before the, high, uh, before the triaxial test. When you're adding, so when you're adding the confine, uh, when, when the samples are in the uh, hydrostatic, uh, uh, for example, as 6,000 PSI, the pore pressure inside the sample are also built up. Uh, if you are doing the geo, uh, geo uh, geomechanics or geotechnical engineering, so the equation that I list uh, in the right corner, in the left corner, is uh, the fundamental equation of the uh, uh, geotech uh, geotechnical engineering called Terzaghi equation. So the total stress is equal to the effective stress plus the pore pressure. But we, if we suddenly, if we make the uh, total stress disappear, which is there, we zero the uh, left side of the equation. So the effective st stress become tensile, and that's how those disking are happens. Uh, so very interesting uh, we, because, I, like I said, I did a, 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 a systematic of the a systematic test of this. So the the spacing of those disking are also depends on the rate of you you release the uh, hydrostatic pressure. So maybe you are wondering the more the the, the quicker you you release, the faster you release, the, 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 the closer the spacing is. Maybe you are wondering why, how, how does it relate to the cementing job? Because it's, uh, for this figure, for the uh, right corner figure, it's uh, the core tripping from the unconventional reservoir. So this is uh, after they did the hydraulic fracturing uh, to the reservoir and they uh, retrieved the core from the uh, stimulated zoom. So they claim these are hydraulic fracturing, but from the uh, a fracture surface, you can see there is no problem in the, they're pretty clean surface. There's no problem inside the surface. And according to the hydraulic fracturing theory, 
the spacing of those uh, uh, disking are too close. It's from one to 10 centi centimeters. So they're basically right now they are, are there's no theory to explain those things, but we believe because um, it's still ongoing, ongoing project. So we believe it's caused by the, we call it poor pressure induced fractures. So uh, why does it, uh, how does it relate to the cementing job? Because uh, like I discussed with Nicholas yesterday, because this uh, cementing is all, because cementing is a poor, a porous media. So how the pressure, poor pressure changed inside the uh, uh, cement is also related to the, your boundary condition. So if your boundary condition changes so fast when you do the operational job, it will also, so those poor pressure inside the cement job will also cause fractures. So I think this is a little bit off my topic, topic, but I think it's worth mentioning. And uh, as we all know, once the cementing job is done, it will sit in there for months or years. So I think it's very important to study the long-term behavior of the cementing job. So that's the reason why we did the creep test at uh, high temperature and high pressure. So the testing con uh, condition here, we, the confining uh, pressure is 3,000 PSI and the testing uh, temperature is 90 degrees C. So the yellow curve is the knee cement and the blue curve is the uh, a 30 percentage of o OBC. As you can see, as the time goes, the blue, uh, the yellow curve goes up, grows up and up. So that means uh, like we have a more viscoplastic deformation here. But on the offset, this uh, uh, blue curve is like basically become flattened means the we so the viscoplastic deformation or even plastic deformation are gone. So even uh, we are working on why this is happening, but uh, this is very interesting uh, because uh, when this when this viscoplastic deformation are gone, it's, I think we treat it as a beneficial factor, uh, beneficial factor to the uh, cementing job. So the last one we did is the self-healing um, test of the uh, self-healing test. Basically what we did is we fracture sample in the tractional test and we do the core flooding. And uh, we set up the pressure difference at downstream and upstream. And we observe the permeability change. Uh, we observe the uh, flow rate change uh, over the time. And uh, based on the Darcy's law, we, calcul we calculate the permeability change. So as we can see, the left figure is the permeability change of the knee cement, and the, the right figure is the permeability of uh, change of the 30 percentage of OBC. So we can see uh, we have a more per permeability reduction of the 30 percentage of OBC. So what's happening here is because we are using CO2 as a penetrating fluid. So once the CO2 is penetrating, so it will react with the olivine particles inside the cement matrix. So at high temperature, high pressure, it will generate the magnesium carbonate at the fracture, sealing the fracture, reducing the aperture. So that's the reason why we're sealing here. Uh, the permeability reduction, uh, the OB, uh, the 30 percentage of OBC have a larger permeability reduction. So uh, I will, um, so conclusion is, so uh, through our study, the, the olivine particles can be carbonated at high temperature, high pressure, but with a way faster rate. So when the olivine particle percentage is go up to 30 percentage. So the Young's modulus is, redu is, is reducted by the 12.4 percentage. So by adding the uh, olivine particles inside the cement, so it completely changed the uh, long-term behavior of the cement system. So it, all, it is observed that both knee cement and OBC has a permeability reduction over time, but the OBC has stronger self-healing ability than the knee cement. So the takeaway message from my presentation today is the, my, the olivine particles can be used as microfiller or microaggregates uh, inside the, in the existing poor land cement system. So it is available to react with the CO2, enhance the pro mechanical properties of the poor land cement and help to pre, uh, prevent this uh, CO2 attack. And the way we discovered a pathway to immediately use the olivine particles into the existing cementing system to enhance the performance of the current cement. And potentially in five or 10 years, hopefully, we are able to develop the geological activating cement without boron cement for geothermal conditions. So uh, I would like to uh, give, a, give my acknowledgement to the National Academy of Science who support our research and our excellent collaborator from uh, uh, Dr. Mileva Randovich from Oklahoma University and Dr. Dustin Crandall from NETL and UT Austin, Louisiana State University and the Sintaf in Norway. Thank you very much. I will be more than happy to answer your any questions.
All right. I think we have some time for some questions. Excellent presentation, by the way. Did you uh, observe any um, slurry property changes when you added the olivine? Like uh, a rheology? We haven't. Get so that's the ongoing work. We we haven't studied the uh, the rheology just properties. Physically, I mean, did you see? Did it was it thicker? Uh, actually, it, this uh, okay. cement is made in US so, OSU. So. Uh, so when you add five percent, you don't really see because the particle size of olivine that we could get for this one was around fifty micron ish so it was a little bit coarser than portland um and we just replaced cement with it and because it doesn't take any water it worked it's not like with zeolites where you can't mix it yeah. uh, when it gets to 30 it's a little bit uh, probably it would need something to be pumped but so far it looks like five percent at this particle size is the best okay thanks um one more did did you look at the permeability of your GAC? That's a fun word to say, by the way. Oh, yes. It's, uh, yeah, the GAC is, uh, that's a very good point. So the permeability of the GAC is a little bit high. It's falling to like 50 milli Darcy or 10 milli Darcy. Yeah. That depends on, because for the GAC, we only do the 24 hours. So we believe like uh, as long as the time goes, the permeability will be reduced. Because as, uh, as you can see from this uh, SEM, there's a lot of unreacted GAC here or unreact, unreact olivine particles here. So this is like, this results only within 24 hours of coronation. And just to add, for, for this one, it was actually olivine sand. So this was very cold. This is not my problem. Yes. Sorry. Oh. Yeah, um, there's a cement, at least one company making a cement out there based on wallostonite and ranconite, you know, calcium, monocalcium silicates with no Portland in it at all. Is that something you can see doing with this material going forward since it's CO2 reactive as well? Oh, I didn't know that, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, oh, I didn't know that company. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can't remember the name of the company, but it's but it's based on the well Austinite, not olivine. Oh, okay. Is it similar? Okay. So, so with this one, really, the inspiration was from the observation in Oman, where Peter Kellerman did this study, and uh, Yushin's uh, advisor, Andrew Bunger, was part of that project. They actually really observed this uh, uh, carbonation uh, through uh, CO2 contact with, with rocks uh, over geological time, and it's all, all fractures, I mean, massive fractures completely filled. So that's where the idea came from and then we kind of turn it around and to see whether this can be used for what we need for co2 resistant uh, materials yeah this paper is a lot of paper it has been cited for more than a thousand times so that last slide you had up there showing the uh, sand and the uh keep going sorry keep further too many animations no. the other way i guess it was uh, but anyway, that you had a mixture of s sand and uh, uh, the sodium bicarbonate. Sodium bicarbonate, yes. When you mix that, that's not pumpable, is it? You couldn't pump it, or could you pump it? That's something I don't know. I'm sorry, but oh, but I mixed the olivine and sand particles, sodium bicarbonate, and with water. Right. And what kind of a slurry do you get? Uh, what kind of properties you're asking for the slurry? So, so this was really not a slurry. It was a sand pack and you float through it. So you pack your sand and then you float through it. So uh, okay. it, it's really not ready for implementation. But one thing that I can see is if we look at what Daniel presented yesterday, you could actually uh, use olivine sand that way, place it that way, uh, and then when it has contact with CO2 brine, it would actually carbonate, magnesium carbonate, if that makes sense. Maybe I made it worse. Turn into a solid y Yes. Right, and then, so if you're using this in a Portland cement, 
how effective it is, is it in in keeping the cement uh, as a cementaceous product in uh, a CO2 environment? That's uh, the ongoing. So right now we're doing the flow through test. So we're like making, we're mixing all the sand particle with the cement and we let the CO2 flow through it. And the right now, because we want to observe the evidence of the fractures, the magnesium carbonate grow on the fractures. So what we did is uh, we have a cylindrical sample, we cut into half, and then we uh, put in the membrane to do the self-healing test. And we do the CT scan before, and after self-healing, we'll do another CT scan, high resolution CT scan. So hopefully we can observe this uh, uh, magnesium carbonates on the fracture surface. So if I can just add a little bit, because this was not fair to him, he hasn't been involved in it. The work was done between two universities. So the hypothesis is that you have these olivine particles. Uh, when you fracture material, you end up with fracture walls. And in each fracture wall, you're going to have certain number of olivine particles sitting there just waiting for that CO2 to attack. They do nothing in Portland cement. They're non-reactive. They're only going to turn into magnesium carbonate once there is a contact with CO2 brine. And so the idea is that you will form some asperities and you start bridging between the two wall and therefore provide some uh, uh, blockage of that fracture. Ask another question. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> any other questions? Do we have any online? Maybe no. I actually have one. Um, do you anticipate? Wait, wait, oh, have more questions. I'll let Mark ask it. Go ahead. So I noticed that the uh, temperature that the testing was performed at 90 C. Have you had any other tests above 90 C? You mean the track show or? Um, yeah, this, yeah. In, the model did everything at 90 C because the project was planned for the Gulf of Mexico. Okay. Uh, we, can go up to, we, we can go up to 180, but uh, this uh, project is. Uh, okay, 180 C. Okay. Yeah. And, and, you know, with some equipment upgrades, we could turn take it further, but there is no really reason for Olivine not to do the same thing. Uh, if you look at the example from Nature, you know, it, it kind of uh, it still works. Hard, the, right? I think the beauty of this is that you could actually potentially heal large fractures. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, my, I can share my uh, like personal experience for this temperature thing. So uh, when temperature goes up, like the equipments are fine. The only thing is for the tractional test, you have a membrane inside the tractional test. So the equipment, or the, the cell itself are good, but for membrane, it can only stand 120. So once it, it goes up to uh, tw uh, beyond 20, 120, it will, the viscosity will become very high. So you need to order the specific high temperature membrane in order to do that, which is we order from Australia, it's very expensive, it's $1,000 for each. Great, thank you very much. Um, Yusheng, well done. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> All right, we're going to move to our next presentation, which is going to be uh, Professor Arash Dahi Talagani, who is also my uh, former colleague from LSU. Uh, Arash is currently at Penn State, and I will let him uh, say a few things about his uh, expertise and what he does these days. Thank you. There's no point. Okay, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, 
Uh, my name is Arash Dai Talagani. I am associate professor at Penn State University, Department of Energy and Mineral Engineering. Uh, so today I'm going to uh, present you the stuff that uh, we uh, have done in the last four or five years uh, to improve uh, cement properties and cement integrity, especially in the presence of high pressure and high uh, temperature. I think... Um, uh, the speakers that we have uh, today and yesterday, they did a great job in um, highlighting the importance of the wellbore integrity. We all know doubt that the bond that should develop between the cement and casing should be strong enough, should not develop uh, microannulus or debonding. It should remain impermeable uh, during uh, temperature uh, changes or um, significant uh, pressure cycles. Uh, although uh, most of the time they will, um, uh, it's mentioned that the oil and gas have solved this problem. Now it's uh, better to um, address this problem at the high temperature for the geothermal wells, but this is not the case when it comes to the wellbore integrity. Um, still uh, hundred thousands of wells are existing, uh, oil and gas wells that are suffering uh, integrity issues. So sustain casing pressure has been a big problem, for example, in Marcellus Shale, now it is in China, um, many places in US or around the world. Uh, one of the reasons to develop a microannulus in uh, some of these cases is the cement shrinkage that happens during the uh, cement curing process and uh, somehow by reducing the shrinkage or compensated uh, by some tricks may address this problem. Um, you know, cement failure problems with the uh, um, cement uh, sheet integrity have been a very well known problem. But most of the efforts um, till recently have been focused on the cement matrix and making sure that the cement matrix will not uh, experience any failure. But, you know, based on the uh, more studies and measurement that have been done with the progress and advances in the cement bond log and other tools, we have noticed that um, most of the time, the problem nowadays are developing at the interface of the casing with the cement. And that is the main motivation uh, for us to go after uh, solutions that can help us to seal uh, cement microfracture or basically prevent uh, formation of these microfractures in the first place uh, by probably addressing the cement shrinkage problem or um, making a cement more ductile, reducing the cement permeability by making sure that the pores that uh, develop in the cement during the uh, process are not connected to each other or they are small size uh, to avoid these issues. And basically having a cement uh, composite cement sheet that has a larger uh, fracture toughness. And all these things together if we can make sure that we will have it at the high temperature would be essential to guarantee our um, wellbore integrity. So to attack to this old problem, um, we have followed, pursued two different solutions. The solution number one is using uh, shape memory polymers. Uh, by using shape memory polymers, we will have minimum impact on the cement design, on the cement chemistry, because this additive have no chemical reaction with the cement. The second approach is using graphite nanoplatelets, uh, which on uh, opposite, on contrary, makes drastic changes to the cement microstructure that we go through that. So first I will start to talk to you about the shape memory polymer solution. So shape memory polymers is not, uh, it's a basically a class of the polymers that have this property. Uh, shape memory property in a very simple language is you can uh, do a set of thermomechanical process, we call it programming, and changing the shape of the polymer temporarily. For example, you can uh, stretch the polymer, you can twist it, or you can compress it. But as soon as the uh, polymer is exposed to the appropriate stimulant, could be temperature, microwave, 
or electricity current, it will go back to its original shape. So shape memory properties also exist in alloys, for example. Shape memory alloys are, for example, used nowadays in um, uh, biomedical industry, but this is not something that we are looking for. Shape memory alloys are more um, stress recovery. Shape memory polymers are more strain or deformation recovery. And price-wise, shape memory polymers are much, much cheaper than shape memory alloys. In terms of the physics behind the shape memory polymers, you may think that um, uh, you can imagine that these polymers are made out of long chains of hydrocarbon molecules. So what we do during the programming process, we are basically increasing the temperature and folding these uh, chains of molecules to each other and developing some uh, uh, weak Van der Waals forces between these chains. As soon as you get, uh, you know, above the glass transition zone of these polymers, you can have activation and uh, recovering the original shape of the polymers. That's how these things are working. So the shape memory polymer that I have put in the um, um, pictures, the slides that you see here, uh, this is uh, right before um, expansion and this is after expansion. This is specific polymer, which is a class of the resin polymers, um, is available commercially over the shelf. The activation temperature is about uh, 70, uh, 78 degrees C. Uh, so basically the formation temperature should be above this temperature to have these uh, fibers activated. As you can see, the fibers after activation, they become thicker and fatter. One important note here is that the whole process is irreversible here. So this is not like a thermal expansion that, you know, it reverses back when you are cooling off the material. So this is a schematic of a programming process that, for example, this is the original shape of the material in this specific case is compressed. And then um, at the elevated temperature, we compress it and then we cool off the system. So that would be the temporary shape. The energy is stored here. So as soon as this fiber is exposed to the high temperature environment, it can go back to its original uh, shape. Um, why we are uh, uh, reducing or programming the um, compression, uh, not along the fiber, but along the, uh, in the diametrical uh, uh, dimension of the fiber is mainly to increase um, the contact area, shear contact area between the fiber and the cement matrix. And that's how we can improve um, tensile strength of the cement composite and also making sure that it is more ductile. So having said that, uh, discussing the theory, now is the time to show that how the things work out in the lab. So in the lab, we have uh, cured the cement sample at the high temperature uh, and the high pressure, 3000 PSI and about 200 degrees C. Uh, this is the expansion ring that we use to measure the shrinkage of the cement during the process. So we follow the API standard basically to uh, make sure that what we have developed is really uh, uh, satisfying the um, at least expectation from the oil and gas industry. So um, here are uh, the res uh, some of the results that we have in terms of the linear expansion of the cement. Uh, the blue lines that you see at the bottom is for the uh, neat plain cement class G. And this is uh, when you have, uh, uh, you add the bentonite to the system. And then this is the uh, uh, green one is the bentonite and SMP. The reason that we needed to add a bentonite to the cement is mainly because of the fact that this polymer that we use has a lower density compared to the cement. So we had to add exotropy to the cement to making sure that we will have enough yield stress to avoid overfloating of this particle on the cement. Uh, 
we have uh, done the tests at the ambient situation and also at the uh, higher pressure and the higher temperature. Uh, uh, this is in this graph, as you can see, the uh, compressional loading, uh, uniaxial loading of the cement sample, uh, plain cement sample versus the cement sample that have been, uh, um, they contain some shape memory polymers have been shown here. As you can see by um, adding shape memory polymers as expected, uh, the compressional strength of the cement will reduce, but this reduction is in the order of 10 to 15 percent. Um, however, it makes the cement more ductile. So as you can see, we reach to the maximum strength at the larger displacement or larger deformation. Uh, one of the benefits of using this uh, additive is the fact that you it does it's inert. It doesn't make any reaction uh, with the cement matrix itself. Uh, this material, this shape memory polymers can be also made in the form of the fibers or other sophisticated geometry. So it can be used as a, um, a loss circulation material for the cement as well. The second uh, type of the additives that we have worked on that to improve the cement properties are basically graphite nanoplatelets. You know, uh, since early 2000, there have been um, significant uh, efforts in civil engineering uh, community to improve concrete and cement slurry uh, properties using carbon nanotubes, carbon nanofibers, uh, graphene, and as well as graphite nanoplatelets. Uh, so no doubt that these uh, graphene plates, they have a uh, superior properties in terms of the strength, um, thermal conductivity, electrical conductivity, and so forth. But the significant cost was always a problem in using these superior materials in improving um, cement properties. So the graphite nanoplatelet that we use despite graphene that is consisted of only one layer of uh, atoms is consisted of several layers of atoms. So having said that, um, having uh, this uh, property, it makes it much easier to uh, synthesize, to manufacture, and the cost of uh, getting, I mean, uh, having this graphite nanoplatelet in the market is about one, two orders of magnitude at least, uh, less than other stuff like carbon nanofiber or carbon nanotube. In terms of the shape here, you can see that how these graphite nanoplates look like versus, for example, carbon nanotube or carbon um, nanofibers. Why we call these uh, nanoplatelets? Uh, to and why graphite nanoplates are promising and working well. Well, the graphite nanoplatelets that we use in our study, the average size of this uh, planar size of these particles is about 25 microns. They are also existing in the smaller and of course uh, larger dimensions, but having 25 uh, micron in terms of the dimension, they only have six to eight nanometer thickness. So they are very thin compared to the uh, dimensions. They are not really 2D material, but uh, in a very good uh, approximation, you can also consider them as a 2D material. The, to get an idea about the specific surface area of this material, only one gram of this material will have about 120 to 150 square meter uh, contact area. That's a huge contact area for a small amount of this material. And knowing the fact that if we manage to develop bonding between the cement matrix and this material, 2D material, we can improve the uh, mechanical properties of the cement significantly. Basically, we are reinforcing the cement rather than steel bar with these nano size uh, platelets that they are even much stronger than um, steel. 
In terms of the density, it's a perfect density, twice more than the water. It's very close to the plain cement density, so you don't have the problems like overflooding or per, uh, precipitation inside the cement slurry as you have uh, with the other material. In terms of the tensile strength and elastic modulus, it's significantly um, high and which is something that is uh, well needed to improve the cement properties, especially under tension. But you know, the main issue when it comes to the nanomaterials and nano additives, even micro additives, is the dispersion of these materials. So if you cannot uh, disperse these materials effectively, and they clamping to each other and things like that, they stick together, you cannot really see significant improvement by adding more of these materials to the uh, cement slurry. And that is the key really to be able to uh, take advantage of this technology. Uh, so this is the SEM pictures of the graphite nanoplatelet 25 microns that we use for this study. We have used also uh, other dimensions, uh, other, um, I mean, graphite, nano places with different sizes. Uh, but here, um, I'm just uh, going to present uh, this specific size to avoid any confusions. Um, how this gra graphene uh, uh, family can help, including carbon nanotubes and carbon nanofibers and uh, um, graphite nanoplates help to improving the cement and concrete properties. Here are some SEM images that can show you how these uh, carbon nanofiber, carbon nanotubes providing a bridging between two sides of the fracture and basically reinforcing uh, the cement at the very small scale, I mean, uh, uh, submicron scales. Uh, but the contribution of these graphene is not just remained uh, to the fact that they are providing bridging and mechanical reinforcing. What has been shown also in the uh, civil engineering literature and chemistry literature is that uh, these materials, if they are um, um, treated uh, properly, they can accelerate or accommodate uh, carbon hydration along them. So basically they can reduce the pore size diameter and, uh, uh, and you know, resulting in a more uniform, homogeneous cement matrix in terms of the pore size distribution. So our approach to, for dispersion of these nano additives is really falling in two different categories. One is, uh, approach was a physical approach that uh, is basically using a high shear rate, um, uh, mixers and also we have looked at uh, the polymer wrapping um, to uh, disperse these uh, graphite nanoplate GMP additives. The second approach that we used is the chemical treatment. So basically we have um, placed carboxyl uh, on top of, on the surface of this material. And we also got rid of some um, organic uh, impurities that are existing on the surface of these GMPs uh, during, um, I mean, naturally because of these, uh, because of the manufacturing process. So uh, in terms of the uh, looking, I mean, by looking at the naked, with the naked eye, you don't see any difference between the graphite nanoplates that have been treated I mean, physically like what is shown on the top picture versus what is uh, in the uh, below picture. And it's been uh, the below picture, it has been treated chemically with a mixture of the nitric acid, sulfuric acid, and other things like uh, acetones. So uh, here in these cartons, we just try to show that uh, how hydroxyl and carboxyl groups that we are placing on the surface of these uh, graphite nanoplates will uh, help later on to develop bonding with the cement and improve that. However, if you are using some physical methods like polymer wrapping or simply mixing this material uh, in the cement slurry, your uh, improvements in the cement property would be minimal. What we have used uh, for our experiment, we use um, 
class G cement. It has worked with the class H uh, CAC cement as well. Um, uh, we made cubic sampled um, two inches uh, based on the API standard for the uh, uh, loading and the mechanical strength properties. All the sample have been uh, cured at the 190 degree Fahrenheit here and 3000 PSI. In terms of the uh, temperature, uh, graphite nanoplateless are pretty stable. So um, we expect them to um, uh, still working at the elevated temperature. Uh, in terms of the concentration, we have a look at 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and 0 0.3. 4% of volume. These materials are not super expensive like carbon nanofibers or carbon nanotubes, but we only use them at a very extremely low uh, concentration. That is the, I mean, the benefit or the real meaning of having a, a nano uh, additives. So what you see on the uh, left-hand side picture is the results of the Uniaxial loadings that we did it with the sample that have gone under acid functionalization for the GMP. On the right hand side, uh, we have done it with the polymer wrapping. By polymer wrapping, you can you can have a rich 24% uh, increase in the compressive strength of the cement, and I mean in terms of the deformation, you can accommodate 10% more uh, deformation or strain before reaching to the failure. But the good thing is that when we do acid functionalization, the amount of increase, the compressive strength and the actual deformation is significant. We can, uh, uh, the green one here is showing the loading curve uh, for a plain cement. And then you can see that, for example, by only 0.2% volume of uh, this additive, you can have a significant improvement in terms of the uh, energy that, uh, can be absorbed by the cement sample before reaching to the failure, higher UCS and uh, larger strain value. But you know, most of the time, the compressive strain is not really a big deal for us. The main thing is uh, bonding, as mentioned earlier. And second thing is a tensile strength or flexural strength uh, that can be representative of a tensile strength. But before discussing those properties, uh, we can also take a look at the rheology of this material um, at the elevated temperature. You know, we haven't noticed uh, significant changes in the uh, rheology of the cement at uh, very low concentration. They even may reduce uh, slightly the viscosity of the system. But of course, if you are uh, going after much higher uh, concentration, uh, it would be significant increase uh, in viscosity. But with the 0.2%, um, you don't see a much significant uh, increase in the uh, viscosity. In terms of the gel strength, again, we are uh, very close uh, to what you have in the um, plain cement. Having the graphite nanoplatelets will help on uh, some extent to making sure that to prevent the gas migration. But really, to be honest with you, the amount of the changes is not much significant to uh, use that to uh, or avoid that in terms of the gas migration. One of the issues that is always a, a drama or headache for um, not just um, cement engineers in the oil field, but also for the civil engineers who are making uh, concrete is separation of the water and the cement phase from each other, or basically they call it concrete bleeding or cement bleeding. Uh, one of the good achievements that we got using this uh, additive is that we uh, could minimize or basically um, uh, got rid of the uh, cement bleeding or separation of the water phase and cement phase. This is at the room condition and room temperature. We also got similar result at the elevated temperature. We also look at the bonding strength. So we use the pushing test. So this is the cement uh, this is the cement, this is the uh, core sample, uh, rock sample in the middle, and then this is the tubing to basically represent a casing setup. It's opposite to the um, uh, order that you have in the oil field, in the wellbore, real wellbore geometry, but 
This setup helps us better to run the test. Um, you know, this is this black line that you see here is for the plain cement. As you can see by adding very small fraction of these graphite nanoplatelets, we got about 175% improvement in the push-out test result. Basically the uh, shear strength at the interface or the bonding have improved significantly with this process. We also repeat this test in the presence of a residual oil-based SMOD, and we still see a very significant improvement, mainly going to the fact that um, this material developed the bonding uh, that goes inside to the rock sample. We also look at this problem. I mean, our sample under the SEM, we can see that uh, uh, these um, graphite nanoplatelets have been shearing off on both sides of the fracture surface. So in conclusion, in summary, we not only improve the UCS, we also improve the ductility, uh, um, decrease the gel strength, in some extent, and also uh, the uh, bonding strength between the cement and casing. Uh, so hopefully this would be a good result and a good beginning for um, field trial and field application of this material in future. Thank you so much for your patience, and I would be happy to answer any question. Thank you. Thank you, that's a very interesting presentation. Um, would you have an explanation for this uh, shear bond strength increase? Uh, well, uh, part of this is that this uh, uh, graphite nanoplatelets also exist in the water, um, um, you know, um, cement infiltration that penetrate into the core sample. That is what we know in terms of the improving the bond strength between the cement and the rock. But in terms of the bond strength between the cement and the steel is that uh, you always have some level of the corrosion or oxidation on the surface of uh, casing. And the way that these things is working is basically develop some bonding, uh, um, you know, this uh, graphite nanoplasm develop some uh, bonding with those oxidated surfaces. So you have on one hand, uh, these GMPs making a bonds with the uh, oxidated surface, corroded area, and on the other hand, with the cement. So basically you don't need to have perfect ideal uh, casing surface. Arush, to get is good it result. possible also that, because these uh, platelets are hydrophobic, right? So maybe they are helping in preventing that buildup of water wall at the interface with the casing, which is usually forming a weakness. Uh, Did you look at the interface? Yes, we have changed the vetability during the treatment process. We changed the vetability of this graphite nanoplates. Ah, okay. That's how we managed to do a dispersion of this matter. Okay. Any other questions? I've got one on up on the board here. If we can throw it out real quick. It says, have you, have you looked at lower loadings of GNP as much of the existing literature generally uses lower loadings in the range of 0.005 to 0.01%. Well, our best result was uh, with 0 0.0, uh, 0.2 uh, volume percent. And I think those values that they are referring to is in the yeah, weight. Um, weight percentage. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in, you know, most of the numbers that we have noticed is much larger than uh, concentration that we used. Yeah, and I, I if I could, Add in, I think that's talking about the graphene, yeah. isn't it? Not? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it, this yeah. is different. Yeah, this is different. We cannot compare. Sure. Uh, you mentioned that the shape memory polymers yes. were irreversible. Uh, yes. Is that an inherent property of shape memory polymers, or can the chemistry be modified to enable reversibility? No, we didn't uh, change the chemistry of the polymer. We, uh, I mean, through this thermomechanical process, uh, we just developed some wonderful forces between the chains. So the, 
we know the color of the program polymer is different from the recovered one. The density is different, but these are all physical. But in terms of the chemics, chemistry, no, we are not changing that. There are some polymers that they naturally have these properties. For example, 78 degrees C is the activation temperature for this. If you have a reserve, for example, for 150 degrees C and above, we have uh, developed another polymer that is specifically worked for that. We basically develop it as a LCM solution for geothermal for DOE. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, thank you once sure. again, Arash. Uh, we are going to have our last presentation uh, online. Um, that's going to be uh, on modeling. Um, so this is presentation on evidence for self uh, restoration of, oops, sorry. Uh, reactive transport simulation of cement rock integrity. The presenter is uh, Tamitop Ajayi, who is a PhD student at LSU, working with um, uh, Dr. Ipsita Gupta, um, also part of our NASM GRP project. Tamitop, can you hear us? Um. Yeah, okay. I can hear. Great. Could Good you afternoon, please? Everyone. Could you please uh, soon you'll be able to share your screen? Yes, I'll, I'll share my screen. Okay. Um, Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, if you uh, would like to go into the presentation modes and your slide will be uh, uh, a little bit larger for us to see. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Temitope Ajayi and um, I'm going to be talking to you about the um, main reactive transport simulation of cement rock uh, integrity. So um, the main objective of this work um, is, um, is to assess um, what will happen um, when you have um, so many brine types in the Gulf and um, how that would affect the um, main cement um, which we use um, uh, in the fields, um, most especially um, for long time frames in which um, our lab experiments um, cannot work. Um, so for this, um, we built a numerical model um, and then um, in order to be able to judge this, um, we used um, the main porosity um, to look at how our cement integrity um, would change over time, over a long period of time. So um, just to um, give us a bit of the main background behind this, um, the unhydrated cement um, goes through hydration and then um, uh, it gets to form these uh, main cement compounds, um, uh, the CSH, the CaO2, the AFM, and the and some other main um, cement product like the hydrogranate and the hydrotaxite. So um, this is um, this is how our main cement is formed before um, it is placed um, deep into the sea or uh, into the main ocean. Um, uh, so, um, in like our subsurface, um, there are so many ways in which, um, our cement could react. Um, it, um, it could react with the rocks. Um, it could react with the brines. Um, it could react with the main gases, which are there. And, um, it could, um, it could react with the main casing too. Um, 
as well. So these are the four different ways um, in which we could have our cement um, in the subsurface and what would go on. So um, it is um, very quite important to be able to see um, uh, how this will change over time. But um, in this work, um, we are just going to work on the four parts, which is the cement and the brine and um, what will happen over a long period of time. So um, I'm going to go through um, the main modeling work. Um, as you know, once you have anything to do with your flow, um, you have to look at the mass, the um, main, the main mass conservation, and um, uh, that's what I, I have shown here. So the rate of change of our mass um, is equal to um, what you call the flux and then um, the source or the sink, um, as the case may be. So um, these are the main phases which we would expect um, in uh, our subsurface. Um, and um, this, is, um, this is how, how you find the masses. And then um, this is the flux and then um, this is the source or the sink. So um, from your flux, because this is just for, um, for our flow. So um, from this flux, you get um, the U and the phase saturations um, uh, from this mass, which you move to, um, to the fluid transport. Um, which is the next phase. So once you solve this, um, you get your U and your and your phase saturations. Um, you move it to the fluid transport here. So the fluid transport is where you bring in the main diffusion, and um, and then from what you've solved for the U and the S from your flow, um, you can then solve for the new concentrations. Um, which you get for the fluid transport. So once you get that, um, you move it to the main reactions as well. Um, so this is how you solve for the reactions. Um, you can use the law of the mass actions um, for, um, for the main reactions that are at um, equilibrium. And then um, if they are not, you can um, use this to find out um, how your modes will change for the main cement minerals. And then um, I put here some of the main equations for the rate and um, how it will change with so many different reactive parameters, um, the reactive surface area, um, your, um, the, the main equilibrium constant, um, the ion activity product, um, and so on and so forth. So um, that's how we have our loop sort of. So from here, um, we can get our phase velocities, which we can then take back to the flow. And then we have the, um, the whole cycle. And we can use that to also find our main porosity and, and the permeability and see how that will change over time. So um, that's just to um, say how this works. And then um, this is the flow chart for um, how this works. So you move from the flow, you move to the main transport, and then you solve for the um, main reactive chemistry um, from where you get the porosity, which you then put back to your flow, and then see how this will change over time. Um, in order to solve this, we use the tough react simulator. Um, and then, um, yeah, um, that's how that works. So. Um, what did we try to solve? Um, we looked at um, the main cement, which we, which we can find in the subsurface and um, what it is mainly being composed of. Um, so I looked at work that had been done and um, I found this work um, for the main cement minerals. Um, so I picked these minerals as my own base point. And then um, this uh, this were the different. Um, I mean, how I would uh, how I would want it to change over time, and what I would expect with time. 
um, once this main cement, uh, the main cement minerals start start to react. Um, so all these are put inside my simulation. And then um, uh, for the brines, um, I also looked at work that had been done in the literature. And then um, I got um, four different brines um, so as to show four um, main different conditions as well. Um, so um, for this brine, it was uh, a main non shell brine and it was CA rich, the main calcium rich. Um, for this one, it was um, a main offshore brine and it was CA rich as well. Um, it was a shell field. And then for this, it was um, the main sodium rich brine. Um, and um, for this, it was the sodium accepted brine. So um, I passed our main cement minerals through these four brines um, so as to see um, how it would affect um, our cement. Like if you put it over, a very long time, um, which um, is kind of hard to do in our labs. So um, these were um, also the um, main physical conditions from which um, I got those brands from. Um, as well, you would need this um, in, in the modeling work. Um, so um, for the main onshore brine, um, this was dead. Um, the main temperature was 112 degrees centigrade. Um, this was the pressure gradient. And then um, I also did this for all the other four brands as well. Um, I'm just showing this so um, you can know where I got my brands from and what were the thermophysical conditions of those brands. And, um, some of these other parameters um, I also got from um, our literature on work that has been done before on the cement and um, what you would expect from it over time. Um, so um, for the main reactive chemistry part, um, it was important to show um, uh, the log case and, and the molar volumes um, which is the main equilibrium constant here, and then the molar volumes. And just like I showed earlier, these are the main cement minerals, um, which I would expect to react um, in um, our subsurface. Um, um, in the same vein, I also um, showed here the log of, of the rate constants, um, just because um, these reactions would change as time goes on. So um, at what rate would this happen? Um, I also just show this here, um, just to um, know what rates they are going, they are going to occur at. So um, this was our model, which we built. Um, this was what we, we thought would happen in our subsurface. You have your well, you have your cement, then um, you have your brines and which will come from deep sources down here. And then um, you have the subsurface rock and then we would expect some cement rock interactions here and then through the main cement as well. Um, uh, so from this where um, we built our own numerical model, um, which is shown on the right here. And then um, we did this for the four, for the four different brands, which I showed earlier. And um, yeah, um, that's what we are seeing here. Um, for the plots, which I would show, I would show plots um, at this point in our cement model here. Um, because they are line plots. So I picked this point, which I would expect would give, um, you know, the worst case maybe since it's far from where you have the, um, the brines trying to come from. Um, so um, um, these are the results which we got. Um, we ran this for uh, a thousand years and then um, uh, 
what we saw that happened was that um, the main minerals which would be responsible for um, our cement integrity would be the Friedel salt, which was prospecting here. And we have also our main nitrogen guides here as well. Um, as you can see here, um, the best um, the best brine was the case one brine um, in which the porosity um, kind of went down a little bit and um, most of the other brines um, had higher porosities um, when you look at it over a long period of time. And um, uh, the, the main minerals which we taught from our work um, was our Friedel salt and the ertringite minerals, um, which were pres which uh, which were prospecting. I mean, of course, there are so many things that would be going on at the same time, but um, we picked these two as the main minerals, which would be responsible for our cement integrity over time. So um, we also did some sensitivities with um, the subsurface temperature. And then um, we saw that um, when the temperature was a little bit lower, um, uh, our cement integrity was much more assured than, um, than when we had higher temperatures. So um, that was also one thing to note as well. And then, um, yeah, that led to the following conditions, um, which I have already, um, said some of it already. Um, the main minerals which were leading to the lower porosity was the ertringite, the Friedel salt, and the gypsum. And the main conditions which we also thought was responsible was the high pH and the lower temperatures. And then um, we thought that at higher temperatures and depth in the Gulf, um, our cement integrity might not be as assured as when we have it at lower temperatures. Um, yeah, thank you for, for your time and for listening. Thank you, Tammy Topic. Uh, we'll have time for a couple of questions. Uh, any questions over there? Thank you, Tammy Topic. Just uh, one thing that caught my attention here um, and it's a good assumption. You're treating your cement as a uh, non-isothermal multi-phase fluid flow. I was wondering, having that said, how did you define your time dependent pressure boundaries, uh, conditions that is? And also, did you look into simplifying the model as a non-multi-phase and looking at other geochemical modeling? Um. As regards our cement pressure boundaries, um, we made it a close boundary. Um, so, um, but we try to make sure that um, we didn't have our own pressures going high by the flow rate of um, our brines. So, um, I, I, I would not think that would be so much of, of, of an issue. And then um, the second question you mentioned was if I only did it from the reactive chemistry point of view without the multi-phase flow. Yeah, basically, did you look at other geochemical modeling by simplifying, assuming your cement system, this is a stretch, would not be considered a multi-phase fluid flow process? Um, Maybe just simplify your your time dependent pressure boundary conditions and those type of uh, for this parameters work, to simplify. For this work, no, we didn't do that. We're trying to look at a situation in which we have it placed in our well bore, and then um, what will happen in that case? Because when you have it in that way, I mean, you have so many different phases flowing, and then um, if we look at it from that point of view, that might be too simplistic, I think. But to try to know what is going on, yes, that might be good. But what we're trying to do in this work was to look at it from the point of view of it being placed in the well bore and what will happen in that case, which um, I would think 
would need us to, you know, take into consideration the main different phases which will be found in the subsurface. I hope that answers your question. All right. Thank you very much. I think we'll close it at that point. I don't see any more questions. Yeah, let's give some uh, applause for that. Appreciate everyone's participation. I think at this time we're going to phase to. We're going to go. We're going to go right into our uh, panel discussion. And Susan, you're going to chair that or what? Okay, so Daniel, you're going to chair it then. Okay, so Catlin's on the way out. We're going to try to get him in here. We'll get this thing started. Um, Catlin and Bob are going to be on a panel. And this is kind of a wrap up, everyone. This is the last day. We'd like to hear what you have to say and what you think, how we did. Um, also, don't forget to give your notes to Catlin after the meeting's over as to your thoughts of what do you think it's going to take to make success in, in our steam emitting work? And also, uh, what do you think we want to do on a, on a, on a follow-up workshop with the SPE and, and geothermal? Okay, I got mine here too. What are your thoughts, Raphael? Okay. Let's have a wrap-up. Adeline, you're, on, you're up on the panel. You're on the hot seat. You're up here. Yeah. Can't get out of this one. And Bob went looking for you. Now we can't find Bob. <clears throat> okay. Don't send anybody else or we'll lose them. I think it'd be great to wrap it up now. I know everyone's been sitting down for a long time, but... Uh, some of us are leaving soon, and it'd be good to just wrap it up right now. I saw your whole, okay. yes, I've got them all. Okay, and great. and do they need to go to Catlin then as well? Oh, maybe so. Yeah. I sent Bob to us. Okay. All right. Good. Great. Awesome. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Who else is going to, Mr. Pilko? Do we have a list? Lou, uh, or to wrap up? Okay. Yep. I've got Susan's notes. Um, where are the notes going to go to? I will collect them if, they, uh, if you guys have it. I'll okay, everything. Susan, just... send them to you and uh, we'll send them to Catlin. And if anybody else has send notes, yeah, she sent them to me, but I can easily pass the buck. So, okay, that's fine. That's fine. So, okay. let me know when we are ready because I would like to propose a, a kind of a academic uh, start of this. Okay, why don't we all come up on stage and, and uh, have a seat or stand up or whatever you feel comfortable doing. I think our two questions are, how did we do this time? How did you like this format? How did you like this topic? And then the second question will be what topics would you like to, would you think would be successful in the future? I've already given uh, Lou my list of five, so. Uh, yeah. So. I have a few here. So why don't we start out with the first question and we'll, I'll ask you Bob and Captain, and then we'll also open it up to the uh, entire group. How did we do this time? We did great. <laughs> What did you like and, and what did you, what specific things were highlights to you? Um, what did you gain the uh, specific things did you learn from? 
and what things did you think could be valuable in, um, as we go forward that we learned this last two days? Well, well I think the, um, what was most important to me on an overall basis is the fact that the issues are being worked and uh, the research is being done and there's more applications to come for the research to be applied. And uh, that's the overall most important thing, uh, both from yesterday and today as well, because um, uh, the lab work begets the application work, begets the wells, and we've got to have the wells to uh, uh, really advance things at scale. Um. Yes, uh, if, if I look on the last two days, I, I think we, we've learned a lot um, about uh, very specific aspects, um, but also I believe that um, we have noticed here geothermal is special. Um, geothermal can learn from oil and gas, but cannot translate oil and gas one-to-one -to, -one to geothermal. And uh, this is something I also seen in some of the notes I received. Um, we need to, um, you know, create a little bit more geothermal focused um, concepts um, on cements uh, and in particularly what I um, always like to mention is that we have to look at the, at the whole system which will be casing cement formation uh, and treat it as a one instead of uh, three individual components. It, 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 it is a full system Geothermal is a full system overall when you go from the rocks to the end user, whether it's low temperature direct heat or it's uh, very high temperature for electrical production. But the well itself, start with the rocks. If you start with the rocks and you understand the best you can, the geology, which includes the uh, geologic fluids, then you can really start to design a well bore. Um, and the uh, casing we can call the um, skeleton, but it's the cementation which really puts it all together and, and connects everything. So this is maybe the most critical part, but I don't want to say one part is more critical than the other because it ties together perfectly. Yeah, I think so. I was just thinking how there's been such a good balance of from operators to service companies to academic to students joining us. Uh, I think there's been a good balance the, the whole way through and some good participation and a little bit more openness about what's being what's going on, what our real problems are and the things we need to solve. So I thought that's a good been made this a good two days. Lou. I you know, from, a, from one of the organizers, and I've been working on the project, this particular workshop for three years now, I thought it was becoming a lifelong job, but uh, what I liked about it is we had a diverse group of people here, a really diverse group, and everybody contributed. Everybody did. And you know, we can have the, the best cement in the world, but if we don't get it in the right place, it doesn't do us any good. So it's a combination of the right cement and the right placement and the plate and, and understanding. Like Catalan said, you got to know, and, and Bob said, you got to know the rock and you know how you got to put it in place. I think the only thing I saw in, in study, and I put a suggestion is, I think we need some, a lot better in situ testing at high temperatures. And I, and I don't think we're doing that as much. Um, we did not talk a lot about acid resistant cement like uh, Halliburton's got Thermolock. I'd like to see this come up with some sort of alternative to that type of cement. That's, I don't know if any of you have done Thermolock before, but I've sat in a rig waiting for it to get hard for days on end. And I'd like to see us work a little bit more on that. Uh, but I'm very impressed with the amount of people we had here, the amount of participation we had. And I want to thank you all for participating there. So that those are my thoughts too.
And I think we should open this, even though this is a wrap up, uh, open this to the floor. Anybody else have comments on the things that you liked other than Bill? No, just kidding. Well, uh, Daniel, b before we do that, since I'm the only professor here on the podium, um, let's uh, do a little bit of, uh, well, at the podium. <laughs> so uh, let's do actually a very quick wrap up because I have the feeling uh, that if I will uh, uh, do statistically here, we kind of all have a sort of different view of what are the cement functions. So, uh, you know, we can start from here and I'll just write down on the board. Um, what is the first function of cement comes to your mind? Uh, you have the honor to say, look. No comment? No comment? Okay, I, I come on. Yeah, I'm a Casey So why do I need cement? Isolation. Zona, okay, zonal isolation. Next one, please. Support case. Government regulation. Oh, that's that's very important. Yes. So um, regulation. Overall well integrity. Well, integrity. This this may be duplicate, but um, protect the casing as well as support the casing. Please. Thirty year life, said Lou. Okay. We're going at thirty. If we can get. If we, if we can get thirty. We'd be. Super please. <laughs> what else? Any other ideas? Because if you look in the pure definition of cement, the first function of cement is actually zonal isolation. Is the only reason why we fill up the annulus between casing and cement. So the question will be, is geothermal asking for something else than zonal isolation? Yes. And that's what we discussed today. We noticed that we need a little bit more support on casing, protection of casing, and long-lasting. Hey, hey, cat. <laughs> uh, no, 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 I got some good answers, at least part of them. Kathleen, I've, uh, I've invited all of the attendees we have to yes. join as panelists. Okay. And uh, they'll be able to unmute as they like to join in the conversation. Okay, thank you. Good to know. So my, my biggest challenge to all of us will be think about whether we really need cement behind the casing in a geothermal way. Regulatory based? Yes. Why, why, why do we need that? If it's not zonal isolation. Your casing is going to fail if you don't have cement behind the casing. If you have a void and it's filled with water and it's between casing and the casing, it will always fail. If you have a void between the bottom of the cement and the top of the cement, an open hole, it'll usually fail. Yeah, it's talking annular pressure buildup. Cause no, failures. great. Well, I'm talking about casing failure. Yep. Yeah, but a, lo a lot of oil wells actually are, are, are drilled and we cement only the bottom part and there is absolutely nothing in the annulus to the surface, right? Yeah, but in, in terms of geothermal wells, you have a, that's one of the differences you've got is the casing is going to go through yield uh, when the temperature changes. And if you don't have any cement in the well, uh, it just pales in compression usually. It's probably what I see that cement will, will really help. Well, and I, I know, I mean, I probably know where, where we're going on this, but annular isolation can be achieved differently. Um, so we can isolate the, the, the well on the annulus differently. But, but uh, for me, it's protecting the casing from corrosion, we need to find a way to do that because uh, 
you can isolate the annulus, but if you're not protecting the corrosion, then that could be a challenge. Yeah, and Catlin, can you tell us where we're going with this and when we're going to get there? Just well, um, it's um, because I, I've seen some notes, and and this is what I, I think that we need for geothermal to redefine uh, and revisit the entire idea of well construction and cementing. Okay, that's your point. That's that the point you're making. Okay, yeah, because and and, and and I'll pause it and, and end on that. If we resolve the geothermal system. Um, issues. We have actually resolved issues for oil and gas and provision of energy almost for the world because uh, these are extremes. They're beyond oil and gas in most cases, but it unlocks a tremendous amount of energy. And uh, um, everybody here, individually and collectively, are the ones who resolve the technology and the technology also resolves the economics along with safety and everything else. So, so, so this is critical. It's wonderful because you're on the front line and uh, um, the technology is being re uh, resolved and um, developed both today and, and all this week. Then I'd also invite uh, all of you on, uh joining us over the internet. If you've got questions or comments on what you got out of this, uh, this, these two days, what were the positives and uh, what were things we can do in the future? Anybody wanna speak up? We see some of your faces. Well, I think the uh, presentations from the grad students and, uh, and new PhDs was, was wonderful. Um, seeing these guys with all the passion when they figured something out and they want to share knowledge. I wish everybody uh, would have that same attitude. Uh, we'd, uh, we would do well uh, with that. But uh, the one thing I, I think I'd like to see myself would be um, to add some, not, not, not a, a majority, but some uh, actual field case studies uh, so that people can get a feel of how this knowledge is applied in the field and, and what, what they see. Um, there, there was a few folks have mentioned um, some field results, but an actual full study or two uh, would be uh, really useful. That's, that's a good point. We had Cal Energy offer their experience, but we could probably do with more of that. That was very excellent, by the way. Yeah, good point. We can consider that when we do similar uh, seminars in the future, trying to make sure we fold that in as well. And uh, we also um, discussed yesterday that uh, we should not be afraid of also exposing failures in our business because learning from those failures will help us to go ahead and, and do that. I, I know oil and gas is far from doing that, but probably we can change this in the geothermal. Well, well one thing about... Um exposing failures. Uh, um, I think exposing failures are easier when you have a whole string of successes <laughs> and, and you can look back. And that's why oil and gas, you know, the failures are usually exposed well after the successes are, are done. So that's another reason why not just learning curve, but scale is so important because if, if, if we end up doing a, a hundred um, geothermal wells in a field or a basin or something like that, and we have one failure, well, we can certainly uh, discuss that failure. But if we have one well and that one fails, eee, it's a little bit tougher. Should I ask this question that's online from uh, Amar? Uh, regulators like us here at Cal Gem uh, need a cement or cementitious material to anchor the surface casing in competent formation so that the BOP stack is secure. Um, does anyone want to comment on that? Steve, I'm even, I'm going to ping you because I see you. Well, if we do, you know, that's part of the regulation. Um, 
and you know if, you, if you're going to anchor your BOP and the casing isn't cemented, it doesn't do you much good. Right. Uh, um, but the same is true of all the other strings. And when you're going to go heat up the casing till it goes well beyond yield, and and takes a plastic strain, um, if the if the casing isn't got something behind it, you know, I'm not sure where the minimum strength is and all that kind of thing. But uh, if it hasn't gotten something there, it's it's going to move and or want to move. And if it's uh, not got any cement, uh, you're looking for a casing failure. And like I said, that's that's usually how we lose the wells. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. But uh, Steve, don't forget the reason why the casing string goes in plastic domain is because we have cement behind. If the string is free to move, there is no plastic deformation of the string. I agree. Yeah. But the strings frequently move in one direction and then won't move back when you cool it off. Yeah, and then it tears itself apart. Yeah. yeah. And most, most of the failures we see or cyclic fatigue error, um, cyclic fatigue issues in the connections. To remind everyone that the casing has uh, something to connect two pieces together about every 40 feet. And uh, the stresses, if you look at them in, in FEA, are concentrated in the, the connections uh, many times as much as a four to five times as much as what is in the pipe body. Um, and that's other than collapses from annular pressure buildup in, in trapped areas. That's probably the, the largest failure mode in oil and gas wells. That is the number one uh, failure mode. But in geothermal, it has to be number two behind uh, trapped pressures. But still, if you can't keep those connections together and they leak, you increase corrosion, you have all kinds of problems that result in that. And eventually uh, you will get a failure from fatigue in, the, in those connections. So I think part of the well designed for geothermal, uh, you want to keep that connection not going through yield, it only goes through yield in one direction, the initial compression and then future times, which means you're trying up the strength a little bit. And the other thing is somebody alluded to uh, the fact that we're moving more towards um, premium connections that have 100% of pipe body yield and compression and tension. Um, I think those have helped not, so that problem isn't as prevalent as it used to be in geothermal. Right. To tell you the truth, I think I, I think I read your book, and I, I think uh, what you said in there was was appropriate. Uh, buttress threads probably have a lower stress concentration factor than even the very best uh, new premium metal to metal seals in the market. So if you're talking about fatigue stresses, cyclic stresses, sometimes the old buttress thread is going to be about as good as any. I think this is a good lead into, I think, our next topic, which is what should we talk about next? And, and maybe Bob or Ketlin, if you'd like to, and, and Bill, I'll let you comment as well, uh, talk about what we're going to talk about next time. But Bill has some comments. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I have comments. So um, I think this was really good. And I thought it was a good idea to hold it in conjunction with. Yeah the GRC too, until I fell asleep about an hour ago. My apologies, <laughs> it, it was just too much for me. But uh, it's been tremendous. And uh, Bob mentioned it and Lou mentioned it, you know, it doesn't matter what the cementaceous material is if we don't have it in the right place. And I think what we need to do, and, and I, I'm just not familiar enough with oil and gas. Every oil and gas job that I was ever on, we did conventional cementing. Pump the cement down the casing uh, with, the lead, with the lead plug and a wiper plug behind it. Bump the plug, everybody goes to the house grinning. 
So in geothermal, we don't do that all that. We do that, but you know, we'd prefer to do a stab in job than a conventional job. We're looking at doing reverse circulation jobs. I did four or five reverse circulation foam cement jobs with a stab in. And they work great. One of the guys that I work with regularly did reverse cement jobs while he was pumping cement down the, down the casing too. And that worked. So getting the cement where you need it is really important. And, and, and I don't know, because I don't know enough about oil and gas, if that's something that we should have a workshop on and include oil and gas people, or if we should have a workshop just for geothermal to talk about cement placement methods. If you don't get it in the right place, it's a waste. What about those of us who do both? Yeah, and, 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 and I think uh, it's critically important uh, for these last two days. This is a SPE geothermal rising conference, and, and that brings in uh, the uh, oil and gas folks. It's, um, it, there's, you know, uh, shale, what I would call easy wells, even though they have to be robust designs, but there's critical and complex well designs. And... Uh, Geothermal is absolutely in a critical and complex well area, and it needs to bring in the highest of technology and continue to develop new. So, so, so what you're saying, Bill, is absolutely correct, and um, uh, but can throw out. It's it's up to everybody with GR, but to have the next one again, combine it with SPE. But if you wanted to have it more in, in Houston or somewhere else, feel free. Nobody minds coming to San Diego, that's for sure. But um, uh, it might tie in more of the, um, uh, we'll say critical and complex well people who deal with it every day. Um, I can say that um, this discussion brings us to um, <clears throat> the probably number one question that has been uh, raised um, or uh, recommended from uh, all of you and this is actually about casing design and in particular a lot of question about um, qualification of casing cement for um, you know geothermal in particular because we want to talk about geothermal and um, it looks like you know most of you have asked this uh, if you are interested about some other comments uh, or uh, topics uh, it was about some geothermal economics um, of course, some geothermal reservoir uh, on that, and then um, um, casing failure, which most likely will be included in casing design as part of the, the part. So, so I, this I, is what I got here. So I think our, our next topic for, for discussion and for those of you online is what type of topics would be useful in the future? And uh, one that's on the floor is casing design. Um, I believe we've also talked about, well, I'll throw, I've got five of them in mind, but geothermal economics. Are there other topics that you would suggest for a joint SPE ge geothermal rising conference in the future like this? Anybody want to speak up? Lou, I'll get your microphone. I gave my suggestions uh, to Catlin, but I think casing design as well as casing failures and casing remedial repairs um, based on uh, poor design, based on um, poor cement, based on corrosion. We need to be able how to repair these and can we repair them? Uh, but I think the next one should be concentrating on casing itself. We had a, the first one we did was on corrosion and it was very well attended, had a hundred people from oil and gas and geothermal. And uh, this one, cementing, I think the next one should be a combination, case and design, corrosion and cementing. How do, we, how do we handle it? How do we put it, bundle it all together and solve the problem? Okay. I, I agree with Lou and I, I, you know, the people in oil and gas that have the closest 
design problems to geothermal are are the ones doing steam stimulation. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure they're concentrated in Houston or in Calgary, but uh, maybe somebody else can figure out how we how we can get more participation in in uh, They've done a lot more work because they got a lot more wells. Anyone? Yeah. Oh, sorry. So, um, so I also wanted to see more about lifetime of the well. So that's like a big thing, which, uh, you know, in our office, they want us to work on because we are in the research. So like degradation, um, and I guess it would include degradation, cyclic failures. And so how long, like if you do nothing. So I know that the, it goes through all the production changes and stimulation changes. And because of that, all this happens. But, uh, but just with time also, like, so any kind of testing or you know how long the cement is going to last or the casing is going to last so that would be good so including that with the uh, experiments and as well as case studies i i want to add to that so i was thinking that for the uh, future future topic because long-term testing is going to take a lot of time so but yeah i was thinking long-term either strength retrogression or corrosion resistance because you guys want 30 30 years and we don't have that kind of data and it would take us time to get that data it, it it's interesting you you ask any any operator any well owner anywhere um uh if you start to talk and and you have to design off of cycles right uh, and if you're talking um low thermal cycle design often you'll get an answer, well, you know, we shut it in once a year, maybe twice a year if we took a survey or for regulatory purposes or whatnot. But things shut in much more often than that for every reason in the book. There might be power failures. Um, uh, there could be anything. And especially in geothermal, the thermal cycles are extreme. So, um, uh, Cy cyclical uh, failures and thermal cyclical failures are really important. So um, how that can be either a topic in itself, as you say, uh, uh, down the road, or maybe tied in as a subtopic, I uh, fully agree. Um, this is very funny, Bob, because um, these are uh, almost 15 years, uh, no, 25 years since I started my first PhD, uh, which was exactly about the cyclic um, fatigue of casing exposed to high temperature. And um, my first paper when I published showed that uh, the casing in a geothermal well may last as low as 12 cycles before fracture. Um, when I presented that, uh, you can't believe how was the response from the audience. So cyclic fatigue, I believe it's, it's really important. Yeah, so uh, on your casing design, will uh, connections be, be part of it? Because I think uh, those are critical, right? So, so it would be good to have a topic where we have some experts on connections and they can teach us about it. Yeah. And, and connection testing is expensive. Um, also, um, connection testing when you get with alloys and uh, uh, full length testing, uh, there are more uh, test uh, frames in the world now than ever before. But before the slump in the oil patch, they were booked up and they were booked up for a year and a half, two years in advance. Uh, now there's uh, windows of opportunity, but it's still gonna cost money and it's still gonna cost time plus they don't go to the very high temperatures. So um, uh, to find a test frame to handle the big diameters to very high temperatures is um, uh, a key and connections or everything. It puts it all together. 
So Derek, I just thought uh, we should add, excuse me, Malay, one, one, one point. Casing evaluation would probably go in with casing and design and casing life, unless you disagree, I think. Yeah, good. Point. Yeah. Okay, so um, the question of the long-term behavior. Uh, when, we were, when we started this uh, study on wellbore leakage for CO2 storage, uh, we had a big meeting like this and, and, and our sponsors, BP and Ford, uh, asked us, what is it that we need? And the answer was, can anybody get us any samples from a well? Whether it's uh, corroded casing, uh, anything that we can see after a very long time exposure that we cannot really achieve in a lab <laughs> in a time that you're asking us. So then you do some reverse engineering. You look at what are the, uh, the products of failure and then you add that to whatever experiments you can manage in a lab and that really helps. And that is really uh, where the academia and national labs really rely on um, uh, you in industry to help us get those samples. Uh, just to add, I have samples of cement five years old in my repository at OU. If you are interested, let me know. I had to do an internal literature search about uh, this type of uh, studies and discovered one operator that was replacing 25% of their wells every year. And they had a field of about 115 geothermal wells. So that's 25 wells per year. And it was, they, they didn't do any engineering. They just ran off the shelf casing and simple connections and very little cement. And uh, they just accepted that. But I think field, Field information, especially on failures or life, if anybody has that kind of data available, would be a really good topic. Thank you. I just added to the list a uh, continuation of case and design, both success and failure, and we'll try and figure out how to word that so we get people to show up and talk to us. But that's a good point. Yeah, I just wanted to add, I mean, I think it's been a lot of good points. I would sum most of those things up as just well designed. Like it's it's the it's the system as a whole. So let's not have a workshop for cementing, and one for casing, and one for connections, corrosion. It's all one system that has to work together. It's not just the cement blends. I think we've heard its placement, but it just yields to the overall system that you end up with. Uh, um, being oil and gas until very recently, I guess there is a fair bit of learnings we can do from oil and gas. They do a lot of very complex wells that. I think we've saw, I think Ashvin had a good talk on some of the stuff we've done to really push the limits there. And that's in the, like called the unconventional gas space. But then I think thermal wells, because I was in that two years ago, I think is where we can go to for a lot of history of wells, um, samples of failures. We have failed a lot of wells because we've drilled a lot of wells. And so I think that's a group that we wanna make sure that we're working closely with because they've done a lot of this work already. I mean, we can say we're geothermal, but we're a thermal well. They're a thermal well. We're exactly the same. They do 350 Celsius steam injection, and they cycle it way more often than you guys do. And so all the thermal uh, modeling for the casing uh, metals, the cement, the connection qualifications, they've done all this work. So I think we need to make sure that they're very much involved. I'll say Calgary is probably your best choice in terms of making sure you're getting those people. I know they would love to come to San Diego. I know. I did <laughs> um, at, at this time of the year or later, for sure. Um, so I think that's, if I could pick an oil and gas group that we work closely with, it's the thermal well design guys, because um, they've done a lot of this work and I think we should leverage what they've done. The lab space they've got, there's quite a few labs up. I think we've heard, I mean, there's vacancies now. There's certainly room available to do tests at uh, Edmonton at Seaford. The, 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 there's a few labs and there's industry funding by those guys. They have companies that drill thermal wells all the time. So instead of just saying, well, we only drill four wells or there's DOE funding, well, there's just industry funding in Canada for, for these wells. So Good. lots out there. But anyway, uh, I, I would add as a topic potentially is drill fluids. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Same. 
Um, so Daniel, um, I want to add one keyword. Uh, as a graduate student, I want to add data uh, because uh, I think, as you all know, like right now, like all the young folks, they are studying machine learning, deep learning, computer science. Even myself, I equip myself with this machine learning, deep learning uh, knowledge. But uh, where is the data? So, like I think, Forge uh, like did a really good, great example because they published all their. Uh, data publicly, like, uh, because I was in uh, Professor Catalin's uh, section in the machine learning of the GRC, like they did a really great job. They, because I have heard, because my fiance is teaching uh, statistics. So I have heard it's a natural language processing for a really long time for like five or four years, but I never thought how to use this into our like oil and gas or geothermal. But uh, since Forge published their drilling reports, so Professor Kelly and his group can like use the machine learning and deep learning thing or technology to like really do some data mining through that uh, like data. So I think because uh, like as my professor, like Andrew Bunger, like two years ago, I talked with him, hey, can we do some machine learning thing? Like, hey, he's a like very old guy, you know? Like he said, no, like I prefer like physical based model, like machine learning and deep learning are very fancy and they're not reliable. Right now we're doing machine learning. So, <laughs> I mean, like, um, I like, like, like this uh, technology. So I believe technology will eventually change our world. So I would like add data to this section. Good point. And we can maybe fold that in as a subcategory somewhere. And, and there is some work going on, but I'll talk to you about it later. Yeah. I was well, going to add that that work is ongoing at UT Austin now with the rapid G GT group. Like they're doing the machine learning with the data. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and, and and we're actually folding in Eric. He just got an NDA signed so that he's going to be joining a, a DOE group that's looking at specifically geothermal wells. And Susan's gone, but her geothermal wells and some we're we're looking to gather data. We're going through the process of, of the gathering of the data so that we can do the crunching on it. So it's underway, but it's good that you bring it up. Other discussion on these topics or other topics that we can throw out before we wrap things up? Going once. I'll, I'll, I'll throw in one more, but go ahead. No, no, we're not wrapping up. We're gonna <laughs> wrap up if everyone's done talking. This is a good time to uh, say your piece. I got wrap up comments, so. I just wanted to uh, let everybody know the reception's been moved to the West Coast Ballroom in the main building. We're currently trying to move it forward to 5 o'clock tonight. Right now it's 5.30, so we're able to move that up a little bit. Reminder that breakfast is available here tomorrow, 7.30 to 8.30, for those of you that are heading out of town tonight. And the last thing I just wanted to, sorry, second to last thing. I wanted to thank everybody who was an organizer, a presenter, an attendee, a sponsor here for this great event. So uh, thank you very much for all your efforts and contributions. Last thing is that uh, as you're talking about the topics here, one of the, uh, the conferences that got put together in Canada when SAGD was just getting started and there was lots of people moving into the space, they're having failures was a conference called the Thermal Well Integrity Conference. It's since evolved into the Thermal Well Integrity and Design Symposium. It's in Banff. It's going on this year from November 29th to 30th. And when that got going, it started off talking about drilling, then they added some cementing, and then they talked about the simulations and how do we get survivability out of our wells. And then it evolved to adding things like what kind of tools do we need to be able to see all of these things? And then how do we get our wells to survive longer? Or how do we deal with them at the 10 year limit when there's regulations that say either fix it or abandon it? And so uh, interesting to hear kind of how this conference a couple of years ago started on corrosion, got talking about cement this time, 
talking about casing next time. So it, it's following a very, very similar path to the one that Thermal Group in Canada put together. And so it might be worthwhile looking at attending that one if you're looking to, uh, to see a bit more of what's going on. And that's probably a group uh, runs a committee very similar to uh, the one that we put together for this conference that uh, you might want to see if there's some ways that we can create ties a little closer. There's a lot of the uh, the challenges that you're talking about here, challenges that they're talking about there too, right? Uh, scale was one that uh, also gets covered off there too, and I see that's a, a huge issue here, right? Hot water, and uh, it likes to drop things out. So, all right. That, uh, Vicky, five, five thirty. Five. All right. Yay. So I just, I just, uh, wanted to say a few words if I can jump in here, Jeff. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank all of you guys. Um, you know, we originally arranged this, this workshop, as you know, for March of last year. Uh, and it's been a hell of a journey <laughs> to get here. And uh, you guys have has stuck with us. Uh, we could have easily cancelled this at some various different at various different points. We, I think we um, originally rebooked it for June, and then we rebooked it for September, and then we rebooked it for I think it was June again, and then I think we we finally got here in October. So all the way around the the calendar almost twice. So um, thank you all for, for really sticking with it and um, for, for really making this possible, right? And, and having the great workshop, really enjoyed it. And I think everybody else here has, has enjoyed it too. Um, I'd like to say uh, a huge thank you to Vicki Lindbergh and Dana Groves who are still right here. <laughs> They've done fantastic navigating us through this, um, not just this last couple of days, but you know, it's, uh, it's a lot of effort and a lot of build up to, to actually make this happen. Uh, a lot of work with the hotel and, and with other suppliers with the AV and, all, and, and everything like that. So, um, so thanks very much, ladies. Um, and then I'd also like to lastly thank uh, Lou and Jeff for, for their chairmanship of this thing um and again just like sticking with it and making it happen so thanks guys for everything you've done to to pull this off Round all right La any last comments jeff i forgot to say there's a survey coming out I'd love to get some feedback from you guys i know we're collecting ideas up on the board here or share them with catlin after we'll uh, do a kind of postpartum once we get the survey results in that feedback in and as we kind of build towards uh 2.0 or 3.0 so i'll uh, i'll pass it to lou for uh, his final comments here well i don't have any final comments other than I thank you to all of you people that participated. Um, it was it was certainly enjoyable. I uh, I got a lot out of it, and I've been drilling geothermal wells for a long time. And uh, you never you're never too old to learn that there's something better you can do. And uh, I think we're on the road to really, you know, our problem with geothermal in, in cementing is we're not standardized. All of us have something different and different ideas and somebody has uh, a, a favorite type of cement or a favorite type of placement. And I think once we come up with something that's pretty standardized, we're going to, we're going to beat this problem. And like, like uh, Steve was saying, if you don't put it in the right place, you're going to fail. And we got to put cement in the right place at the right point every time, because the stresses are so, so high in geothermal, the, the heat is just tremendous. And, I think we could come up with an answer. And I think this is the way you do it. The oil and gas and the geothermal people here. So thank you a lot. One lesson, thank you very much. I have one question for the organizers. What, if any materials will be available to us after the workshop is over? Well, yeah, 
yeah, I can answer that. You'll you will be receiving um, uh, a waiver form that uh, everybody will need to to sign to to um, sure. the presenters at least to sign off that they're happy that the their presentation can be distributed and that uh, their recording can be distributed. Um, so once we have all those forms in, then we will set up uh, some form of file repository for everybody that they want to go there and download things. So, and if you know if anybody has any questions or would like to talk, you know, contact me. Uh, I'm here. You can have one of my business cards, and we'll go forward. We've got some suggestions for the future. I'll be I'll be there helping to plan the next one. Thank you. Fantastic. Enjoy the reception. Can you send me a copy of your business card?